Hello and welcome to Histology Part 2. This is our third lecture, so we are continuing from the Histology and Tissues lecture and PowerPoint. So we basically stopped halfway through and now we're going to be finishing the second half. So just a reminder, we already talked all about epithelial tissues. Now we're going to be getting on to connective tissues and there is a variety of them. They're quite a diverse group. So we are all, we're not only going to learn about each one of them, but again, where are they located? Super important with anatomy. Functions come later, although we do have some functions, right? But really what we're going to be focusing on, are what are they, what do they look like, and where are they located? All right, so there are four types of connective tissues. The first one is going to be connective tissues proper. These are your, well, your proper connective tissues. Um, next up, you have your blood, which is going to be your fluid connective tissue. And that's one that people don't really kind of associate with a tissue because you kind of think of like a tissue layer. But your blood is a connective tissue, right? And it is very useful. Next up, we have cartilage and bone. Okay, so cartilage and bone are going to be both used for structure, for support. These are known as supportive connective tissues. Now, there are typically two ingredients to make up connective tissues. We have the cells themselves. And the cells are going to vary, vary on location, vary on type of connective tissue. Right? They're going to be vastly different in shape, shape and function and all of that. Um, and the next one would be the matrix. And you kind of think of the matrix as like everything in between the cells. Sometimes there's going to be a lot of space in between the cells. Sometimes there's not going to be a lot of space in between them. So the matrix is going to be very small. But the matrix does also include things like the protein fibers, right, used for support, anything in between. Um, and then the ground substances, which we're going to talk about when we get to each one of the actual um, tissues, because they do vary depending on. Okay, so next up is we're going to talk about where these certain cells came from. So each one of them has an origin, right? Each one of our cells has an origin. We replicated from one original cell, right? One fertilized embryo. Um, and basically what happens is each one of these cells becomes specialized later on. And so that's what you can see right here. So we start in the mesenchyme. This is just, again, the origin. Where is it coming from? And they all start in the same place. But then very quickly, they do separate out into these what's known as cellular descendants. And so essentially, it's what types of cells came from that original cell, right? So we have our fibroblasts, we have our chondroblasts, we have our osteoblasts, and we have our hem hematopoietic stem cells, right? So depending on which type of cell that connective tissue we're talking about has a different origin. So if we follow the first one, a fibroblast gives rise to a fibrocyte, meaning cell, right? Which essentially gives rise to all of our proper connective tissues, our really true connective tissues, right? And that would be your loose connective tissues, your dense connective tissues. Under the loose would be the areola or the adipose, the reticular. Don't worry about that. We're going to see that in a slide or two. And then under your dense connective, you've got your regular, your irregular, and your elastic. Now, if you're talking about a chondroblast, right, that's the next one, your chondroblast gives rise to your chondrocytes. Your chondrocytes then give rise to your cartilage, all different types of cartilage, including hyaline, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. Next up, we have our osteoblasts, sorry, osteoblast, osteo meaning bone, right? So our osteoblast gives rise to our osteocyte, which gives rise to our osseous, which is just bone. Right? And there are two different types of bone. There's the compact bone, the really hard outer part of the bone. And then you've got your spongy bone. That's usually going to be on the inside. Um, squishy. That's not so much spongy, but there's a lot more um, space in between. So it's compact and spongy, right? Porous, you can think of. Um, hematopoietic, we've got the, uh, this essentially gives rise to your blood cells and your macrophages. Now I'm probably saying that terribly because I've heard it several different ways. Um, but it's okay. You don't have to know how to pronounce it. You just have to know how to spell it, right? Anyway, these are going to be give rise to all of your blood cells, including your red blood cells and your white blood cells, also known as macrophages, right? Which gives rise to your blood. Now, depending on all the different types of blood cells, white, white blood cells, which we're going to learn about later on in the semester. Um, but really right now we're just looking on, we're focusing on origins, right? Which of these origins, uh, which of these cells has what origin? All right, let's start with our proper connective tissues, right? The OG connective tissues. Now, there are two different types that I talked about, the dense and the loose, right? So the loose is going to have a lot more of that inner matrix space in between the two cells, whereas your dense is really going to be kind of packed. And we're going to see what those are in just a second. Now, the categories do include, for the loose connective tissues, we have our areolar, we have our reticular, and we have our adipose. 
for the dense connective tissues, we just have regular, irregular, and then elastic. All right, let's start talking about our areolar connective tissue. This is our first one, and this is a highly vascularized tissue, and that just means vascular system. Think your circulatory system, literally what that is. So we've got a lot of blood coming to this area. We've got a lot of oxygen, right? You've got a lot of circulation, and that's really important because these guys are going to protect your organs, right? Essentially, what they're going to do is they're going to create this, this nice mesh protection around it. And that's what you can see right here. We've got all these collagen fibers and elastic fibers, right? And basically what's happening is this is protecting, right? This is wrapping around and almost insulating and cushioning each one of our organs, which is really important because we don't want to damage our organs. We kind of need them. Well, we need everything, but we really need them. Um, this is also plays two important roles in inflammation and fighting infection, right? You have to remember vascularized means you've got those blood cells. So it's coming in. So not only do you have lots of oxygen, but you're going to have those white blood cells. So anything foreign, anything, you know, that your body needs to get rid of really quick, like infections, boom, as long as you have a lot of vascularization or circulation, you can then send lots of those uh, white blood cells to that area very quickly. Now, these guys do have a very wide distribution, typically under the epithelial. So remember, the epithelium is like the top layer, and now we're working our way down. We're working our way deep, right? So they are under the epithelial, and you can, again, see right here, they're basically just surrounded by these capillaries. And that's really important, again, because we are fighting infection. We are reducing inflammation. So when you have to send those histamines in to reduce the inflammation, you have that basically highway to do it pretty quickly, which is great. Okay, moving on to the next one, we have the reticular connective tissue. So now this is connective tissue, but it is known as reticulated. And essentially all that means is that it has these reticular fibers known as reticulin inside of them. And that's basically kind of, <coughs> excuse me, used for support, right? As long as we have this reticulin thick fibers, we now have a lot more support than we would in say other connective tissues. Right? So we do have almost like a soft, internal, flexible skeleton known as the stroma. You can kind of think of it like that from photosynthesis, right? The stroma, that internal matrix area, same kind of thing. This is basically used to support other cells, right? So we are creating a supportive structure that basically just kind of covers this whole area with these reticulated fibers. And that basically just allows this nice, flexible, but sturdy mesh. Again, super crucial for things like your lymphatic system, right? Your lymphoid organs, anything associated with that is going to be your lymph nodes, your bone marrow, your kidneys, your liver, your spleen, all of these really important to actually protect and to, to support using these reticulated uh, connective tissues. All right, moving on to adipose tissue. So adipose is essentially it's your fat, right? It is your fat cells. And that's what you can see right here. We've got these huge fat vacuoles containing these fat droplets. And so these are probably some of the most easy to recognize um, of the connective tissues. And that's because you're always going to have these, again, these giant, massive openings in between. And you can kind of see here, like, some of the nucleuses are squashed and they're kind of pushed up against the side of the cell. And this is because that fat droplet, that vacuole, basically takes up pretty much the whole space. So um, it is pretty much tightly packed, even though it doesn't look like it because these guys are squished together. These, these fat droplets are basically just taking up all of the space. So they are packed in together, even though it doesn't kind of look like it, because it does look like these are just giant openings. They're not. They are vacuoles containing fat, so do remember that. Now, fat is not necessarily bad. Fat is a great source of energy, right? Our body likes fat. Our body wants insulation, right? To keep nice and warm, especially during the winter time. Um, it also helps to protect our organs as well, give us that nice cushioning. So say if you fall down or something like that, oh, you're not bruising your spleen, right? Because your body has a nice layer of fat protection around it. Um, also protects, we talked about insulation, heat loss, right? Think about marine mammals like whales and um, sea lions and stuff like that. They have a lot of fat on them and that's because they live in a cold environment. So that fat not only provides amazing sources of energy when you need it, right? Great storage of energy, uh, but insulation as well. So nice, nice cushiony protection, um, support, heat, energy. So the location again would be your around your kidneys, really important to protect your kidneys, a vital organ. 
Um, you've seen those movies where people get like hit in the back and they're like, oh, right, that's your kidneys that you're essentially getting hit in. So protecting those are really important because those are vital organs. Um, obviously under your skin, you're gonna have a certain layer of fat throughout our body, we all have it. Uh, and then behind your eyeballs, which is interesting. So you guys do have this cushioning little fat pockets behind your eyeballs. And that's because again, we don't want, if you do get hit in the head, if you, anything like that, you really want to protect these very fragile organs. And that's for, that's what these, these adipose tissues are really, really important um, and useful in doing. Obviously also found around your abdomen and in the breast areas. All right, moving on to the dense regular connective tissue, right? So this is packed together, hence dense. And that's what we can see right here, right? So these are usually parallel and you can kind of look at this and be like, well, they're not straight. They don't have to be, right? They're paralleling each other. So they're kind of moving this wave-like pattern, but you can see one right here and here and here and here and here. And so they are parallel. And that's what that means by these parallel collagen fibers going all the way across here. You can see these elongated, almost squished uh, nucleuses or nuclei. They are elongated again and kind of stretched going along these fibers right here. Now, typically our dense regular connective tissues are going to be found along our bones, right? This is attaching muscle to bone. This is attaching bone to bone. This is kind of like the bulk of our movement, right? So that's really what these guys are going to be um, used for. And that's great because these guys can withstand a lot of pull in one direction. Now we are going to see ones that can actually withstand pulls in multiple directions, but typically this one's being pulled in one direction. So you can think of your, right, your contraction of your arm. Fun fact about muscles, guys, they actually don't push off anything. They only contract. They only can pull. So we're going to learn about that when we get to muscles, but um, that's hence basically what they're, these guys are doing. They're all pulling in a similar direction. Uh, these ones are going to be found in your tendons, your ligaments, anything that has to connect, especially bone to muscle. Those are all going to be those tendons and ligaments we're going to talk about um, coming up. The uh, aponeurosis, basically this flattened tendon that um, attaches the bone to the fascia. We're going to learn all about that. And then the fascia around the muscle. Again, this is just that matrix area around the muscle, which we're going to talk about when we actually get to muscle. Uh, dense irregular connective tissue is just that. So imagine our dense regular connective tissue pulling in one direction. This guy's actually pulling in usually a variety of directions. Um, and that's because this guy is basically lots of collagen fibers and kind of, kind of arranged in just like a, like a hodgepodge, like a mismatched, right? Not parallel whatsoever. This is basically just irregular. So, and then hence the name irregular is because there is no real set standard pattern or shape. It just kind of moves in this wonky way. So if you see that, you can know it is definitely going to be a dense irregular connective tissue. Um, and again, withstanding that tension, right? Being pulled in multiple directions, depending on where you're located. Um, great structural strength, again, because you can be pulled in that multi-directional, um, you know, tension. Uh, it's basically really, really great for things like the dermis of the skin. Right? We move in all sorts of different ways every single day. And therefore, having this dense irregular connective tissue around the layers of your skin kind of allows you that more flexibility instead of that more rigidity that you want sometimes where you're protecting organs. Right? We don't necessarily want those being super flexible. We want those to stay in place. But things like your skin and other muscles like that can definitely have a lot more versatility. Also found in the semi-mucosa of the digestive tract and the fibrous capsules of joints and um, uh, organs. All right, moving on to cartilage, moving on to cartilage. So we do have three types. We have the hyaline cartilage, the elastic cartilage, and the fibrocartilage. So those are the three categories that we're gonna be talking about. But cartilage you can think of as, I mean, this is some of our cartilage, right? This as well, right? It is a firm yet flexible tissue. So it will hold its shape, but it does allow for some flexibility. Now it does not contain any blood vessels, which is why you can say pierce your ears and especially up here in the cartilage part, you get almost zero blood. There's really no, no bleeding whatsoever because you don't have that, that uh, vessels, basically. You don't have any of the vessels. Um, ooh, the cell type is known as a chondrocyte, and that's what we can actually see right here. And we are going to go over the different parts, but this is a very clear... Mm, So the cell type that we're going to be talking about for cartilage is always going to be known as a chondrocyte. And that's what you can see right here. 
And there are going to be shapes slightly different, but they're really recognizable. So make sure as soon as you see something that looks just like this, almost like a little bean shape with some space around it, that's going to be your chondrocyte. Now, you can see the chondrocyte right here, which is in the lacuna. The lacuna just means like space or gap. Um, and then this is, again, going to be the matrix, that intercellular space, right, in between. And so you can see these very recognizable chondrocytes sitting in that, again, that little lacuna, that little space inside the cell. Now, hyaline cartilage especially is going to be found at the ends of your long bone. So you can think of like your femur, right, the largest bone in your body. That's going to be a long bone. You can also find these in the coastal cartilage of the ribs. You can also find them in the cartilage of your nose, your trachea, your larynx, right? Everything that's going down here, this is your windpipe. You wanna keep this open. And you can actually put your little finger right here, that ball in your throat, that Adam's apple, that's your larynx, that's your voice box, right? So we don't want that collapsing. In fact, when you see things like people who have that um, surgery that's basically just right here where they basically open it up, that affects their voice box and that's because you've broken into your, to your larynx. So that is your hyaline cartilage. Next up, we have our elastic cartilage. Again, you've got your tiny little chondrocyte in here, same general kind of bean-like cell shape, but your lacuna is gonna be a lot larger in this type of cell. And this is one is gonna basically support your external ear. So that would be the elastic cartilage that's here. You can see it is moving around. Also gonna be found in your epiglottis. Your epiglottis is gonna be found right here in your throat. And essentially it is your opening to your esophagus. Okay, so you do want certain things to go down, but you don't want other things to go down. Like if you ever start choking on something and it kind of goes down the wrong pipe, right? Your epiglottis is kind of in control of this. It's basically the little flap that opens and closes. And so you do want one, you want that nice support, you want that shape, but you kind of want it to be flexible as well. Hence, elastic cartilage. Now, fibrocartilage, uh, this is basically going to be found in your intervertebral discs. So in your vertebrae, in between your vertebrae, you're going to have this fibrocartilage. Also in your pubic symphysis um, and also the disc joint, uh, sorry, the disc of your knee joint. Um, that's all going to be fibrocartilage. Now you can see this right here. Now these guys are very greatly reduced. They're much smaller. You've got a lot more fiber here with your cartilage, hence fibrocartilage. Right? And so you can see your tiny, smaller chondrocytes here. But again, same kind of shape, same kind of bean, um, basically small bean shaped inside your cell, right? Pretty distinguishable. And then again, you've got all your collagen fibers, which are going along here, hence fibrocartilage. Ah, moving on to our bone tissue. Our bone tissue to me always looks like the rings of a tree, which actually is kind of funny because we do grow from the inside out, hence those rings. Um, and it's a lot of parallels with the natural environment, like plant life. And I don't know, just coincidental to me, but maybe not. But anyway, so you can see right here is you can see the center here and you can see your basically circulating centric rings forming outwards. And in between, you can see the osteocytes right here, right? These are the bone sites and they're going to be surrounded by that lacuna again, just basically that space or that gap. Okay, so it should not be a shock to you guys that your bones are your support system, right? Is your skeletal system. And so this does allow it to uh, provide basically not only support and protection for our whole body, but it also provides attachment sites for our muscles, right? Because our muscles can attach to our bones, our bones are our support system. We can actually be extremely, you know, um, flexible. We can be fast. We can be all of the things that associate with movement, Right? We can be because of how strong our bones are and the attachment to our muscle systems. So super, super helpful for us and evolution. So we can do all the things that we are able to do now. The running, the jumping, the finding food, all that kind of stuff. Thanks to our bone system and our, our muscle system. Now, bones not only are used for structure and movement, right? But they're also used to store calcium and other minerals, um, so this is why it's so important when you're growing and you're developing that you drink lots of milk because that calcium is for growing bones. You guys have all heard the commercials, right? And it is, again, you want to keep your bones nice and strong. As we age, we kind of lose that calcium and that's when our bones start to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And that's why as you age, you actually tend to get more fractures. And so it is still important to, to maintain that calcium level in our bones because it does deteriorate over time. Next up, we have our blood tissue. This is our blood tissue. So this is a connective tissue, but this is one of our fluid connective tissues. 
Um, and essentially this is for transportation of gases, right? We need oxygen to all of our cells, but it only comes from our lungs. All of our cells produce metabolic waste that we need to get out, right? Transportation. So any kind of gases, nutrients, waste, any transportation that we're doing, we're doing this through this fluid connective tissue. It is connecting our whole body, but it is fluid, obviously. Now our blood does consist of cells, right? Red blood cells, white blood cells. That's what we can see right here. These small red ones with no nucleus are the red blood cells, right? And you can see these large white blood cells like the lymphocyte and the neutrophil. We're gonna learn all about white blood cells when we get to that part, but you will be able to identify each one of these based on their staining. Now, um, it also is composed of platelets and plasma, but we're gonna have a whole lecture on blood, so don't worry about that. We're just learning about blood tissues now. But we're basically, it's what makes your blood coagulate and clump together, the platelets, um, and the plasma is everything else in between. So we're just gonna, we're gonna save that until we actually get to blood. But so what, what we're moving on to next is muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is the last one that we're gonna be talking about today, muscle tissue type. There are three different types. It is skeletal, it is cardiac, and it is smooth muscle. And we're gonna be learning about each one of them and where they're located. Now, you can't see the cardiac muscle. This should be cardiac, right? It means heart. This is basically everything that's gonna be associated with your heart. Now, this is involuntary muscle. You don't have to think about this to move it. If I wanna raise my arm, I have to think about raising my arm. It doesn't just naturally raise. But your heartbeat does naturally keep going which is super important because that would mean if we fell asleep and it was voluntary, we'd forget to beat our heart and we would die, right? So that's one of the involuntary mo motions and that that's what that means, involuntary. We're not voluntarily making it happen. Your skeletal muscle, right? That's one that allows me to do this. Of course, that is voluntary. We have to actually think and send messages to our body to make that happen. Finally, your smooth muscle, another involuntary control. This is your digestive system. Right? Think about as you eat that cheeseburger, you're not thinking, hmm, now I have to move it to my stomach. Now I have to move it to my duodenum. Now I have to move it to my large intestine, or small intestine. Now I have to move it to my large intestine. Right? You don't think about that. Your body just naturally does it. So that's involuntary mo uh, movement. It's moving things forward, but you're not actively moving them yourself. I mean, you are, but you're not thinking about it. Skeletal muscle is really easy to identify because of these striations. See all of these tiny little lines? And I know it's probably hard to see in the video, but look at your PowerPoint because you can see them way better. And these, these striations are super obvious. And this is skeletal muscle. We need to do a lot of contracting, right? And that's what these are. These are bands that are able to contract each one of those striations. So that's what's gonna give us that great range of motion and those bursts of energy when we actually need it is all of this. Now they are multinucleated. So you can see the multiple nucleuses right here right? Nuclei, as well as the obvious striations. And usually what we're looking at is these long cylindrical cells right here. So that's what we're looking at. These long cylindrical cells with the nuclei spread in between here and the striations right here. Uh, now these are used for voluntary motion. We talked about that. So that is the skeletal system, right? You are choosing to move around. Um, your facial expressions are also controlled by this. Um, and basically, these are any of your muscle tissues that are going to be attached to your bones. Or skeletal muscle, it's in the name. So this is pretty easy to identify where they're going to be. Now, cardiac muscle is next. That's the one we talked about. That's an involuntary motion. That's the one that's going to keep your heart beating. Super important because it's going to propel blood to your circulatory system. We would die pretty quickly if our brain did not get the oxygen that it needed, as well as all of our other cells throughout our body, right? It need, they need nutrients. They need energy. They need oxygen, right? So this is our circulatory system. Sorry, this is controlling our circulatory system. It's going to keep it going and therefore keep us alive, which is kind of important. Now these guys do have these branching cells and so I want you to follow me here. We kind of come in here and then we split and then it splits again and it splits again. This is branching cells. So they do, they are branched out. And that's kind of important for the cardiac muscle because we are creating this very covered, protected and vascularized system, which is super great for your heart. Um, we do have uninucleate, meaning one nucleus. And you can see the nucleus is right here but all of these different cells are going to be connected with just the singular nucleus. And there are obviously one for your whole cardiac system, but very 
not multinucleated. So they are not multiple nucleuses for each of these cells. It's going to be, it's going to be pretty much one for multiple cells. Um, another key characteristic, super easy to identify cardiac muscle is these intercalated discs. And that's what you can see right here. We've got one here, one here, and one here. All of these just boom, 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 these little tiny lines that look like they're separating the cells. Those are intercalated discs. Um, and again, the location, the heart, right? The, li the lining or the walls of the heart. All right, we have smooth muscle, right? Smooth muscle is our last type of muscle tissue. These are smooth muscles because you can exactly see this. No striations, no intercalated disc, just nice and smooth, right? Usually spindle-shaped cells kind of look like, almost like little fibers, right? No striations, no intercalated discs. Right? You do have these small nuclei, nuclei spread throughout here, right? but no other striations. Now, these ones are going to be lining your internal digestive system, right? your internal organs, and not just your digestive system, but any kind of pathway that has to keep things moving along. That's when you're going to have these smooth muscles. And so that's literally what they're doing. They're basically involuntarily controlling that things continue to move throughout your body. You don't want things getting stuck in your body, right? Your body takes things in, it needs to release things um, and a variety of different things. But um, so these guys are gonna be found pretty much the walls of any of your hollow organs. You can think of like your di your stomach, your duodenum, your small and large intestine, right? These are all organs with that are hollow essentially. And so that lining, that inner lining is always gonna be this smooth muscle because again, we wanna make sure that whatever we're moving through gets actually moved through. Okay, I lied. I did say that the, <laughs> the muscle tissue would be the last of our tissues. Our nervous tissue is the last of our tissues. This is our neuron right here, our control center. This is what's sending every signal to our bodies all day, every day. And these neurons are crucial because again, they're sending electrical impulses throughout your body to signal so many things. Everything in our body is basically signaled by these neurons. Well, I can say everything, but a lot of things, a lot of things. So your brain, your spinal cord, your nerves, nerves throughout the body, right? These are all going to be your nervous tissue. And that's what you can see right here. Um, now this one, you can't really see super well. You can see some nuclei right here of the supporting cells. This is going to be your cell body of the actual neuron. These are what's known as your neural processes. I can show you a little bit, there you go, a little bit easier right here. Coming out are going to be your dendrites. This main part is going to be your cell body. Inside that cell body is going to be a nucleus. This is your axon. So basically, you've got your incoming signal receiver, and then you've got your outgoing receivers. And that's what that axon and those dendrites are going to be doing. Um, these are going to be your little neuroglia cells right here. And that's pretty much the nervous system. Well, the nervous tissue. Wait till we get to the hour lecture on the nervous system. This is a lot more complicated than just simple nervous issues, but that's it. That's all I have for you guys. That was histology part two. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I will see you for our next segment on the integumentary system. Um, guys, thank you so much. Make sure to keep up with the lectures, keep up with your homework, keep up with the labs. Don't forget to check due dates. We will have one more lecture before our first exam. Make sure to always check the syllabus though, just in case things have changed or schedules have changed. But anyway, guys, thank you so much. I will see you guys next lecture.